Everyone that I've talked to about this issue had never heard of it, and it is the greatest environmental crime in America. Well, the Capital Regional District has rejected a proposal to reconsider sewage treatment. Oak Bay Council is leading the charge for an independent environmental assessment to compare the benefits of treating sewage to leaving it untreated as it is now. This is where biosolids are being produced. Everywhere across America, everywhere that a toilet flushes, everywhere that sewage lines converge in a city, they have a biosolids problem and they have to get rid of it. Raw sewage, finding a way to make it a little more useful for local farms by creating fertilizer. But the question is, is this change safe and sanitary? When Tom Estabrook is gardening, he's not thinking about what's in the soil. I don't worry about that whatsoever. Remember, everything you flush down the toilet goes into these biosolids. If you wouldn't put it in your own garden, don't flush it down the toilet. Many of you may or may not know, but EPA regulates uh, under our environmental statutes like the Clean Water Act, like the Clean Air Act. But there's no Clean Soil Act, which means that the government has said we can mass pollute the soil and call it legal and call it green and call it recycling. So we now have government legalized pollution and it's been legalized by the EPA, which I would say, in my opinion, is a highly corrupt organization that needs to be radically reformed to actually protect the environment like they used to do back in the 1970s. The EPA and we as a country have inadvertently created really a devastating vector for bioterrorism of ourselves. Biosludge always contains one chemical, we found. There's one chemical that's a marker for it. It's Benadryl, the over-the-counter drug. Our ecosystem is in the crosshairs of this biosludge industry. They're making money while poisoning the planet with toxins that persist in the environment. This issue is so much larger than at first it would appear. It's not just about toxicant exposure, it's actually about the very root of our species definition being completely undermined. Anyone can walk up to a sewage treatment plant, access a sewer line, and put uh, tons of material in it that would never be detected. At a time when we've got the World Health Organization and the CDC very concerned about the rise of antibiotic resistant superbugs, uh, here we are, city by city, spreading infectious material, viral material, antibiotics in the, in the bio sludge uh, with pharmaceuticals and hormone disruptors and immune suppressors. And then we wonder, well, why are people getting sick? Sewage sludge contains over 80,000 chemicals, and that's because the EPA made a, a rule that requires all industry to dump their uh, industrial chemicals in sewage. And every year there's a thousand new synthetic chemicals. And of course, EPA keeps selling us its you know, nutrient rich. But what they are doing out of ignorance and greed uh, is basically a form of, of domestic terrorism when unknowingly or uh, unwillingly they spread uh, uh, the myriad of uh, pathogens and toxins that cannot be eliminated from the natural environment. They are immune to prosecution, uh, but let any scientist try faking data for his own personal gain, uh, they don't last any time. They will be fired and put in prison. But fake data for the government and its interest, in the industry's interest, and you will be promoted and protected at the highest levels. So this is a problem that multiplies itself in our living environment. All it takes is one person in one city to create a tremendous infectious disease event that can be extremely costly. Any toxic chemical that a bioterrorist could want to use can be added to a sewer, go through the plant, be spread out in the surrounding city and countryside, courtesy of the municipal government. Nobody will know it until 
people start dropping dead. Rather than using the euphemistic term biosolids, in our work, we prefer the term toxic sewage sludge. The sludge, the solids, that come out of the back end of anybody's publicly owned treatment works or wastewater treatment plant is sludge. It is the solids. It is known as sludge under any federal definition. And because it is toxic material, we refer to it as toxic sewage sludge. Sewage sludge contains every single chemical that you can imagine because every industry, every entity that's connected to a sewer can discharge their hazardous and acute hazardous waste and treatment plants are not designed to re remove these. So it is not a wild statement to say that the sewage sludge is likely the most pollutant waste mixture of the 21st century. Well, when humans consume all of the mostly processed foods, which are contaminated with a lot of man-made uh, pesticide residue and insecticide residue, I mean, you look at the earth and it all starts really from the farms, when the plants are sprayed with all kinds of industrial chem chemicals and herbicides and pesticides, and it's really like a revolving system that goes around because then you have rains and you have the water runoff that goes into the rivers and into the lakes and, and contaminates the water. So this whole system just circulates around and then it goes to the human. Biosolids is a stream that's exiting a wastewater treatment plant. And probably the best way to describe it is a wastewater treatment plant takes inputs from the sewer system. And it's split into two separate streams. You have a liquid stream and you have a solid stream. The solid stream is known as wastewater effluent or wastewater. You know, these companies try to recirculate this and they try to recycle all this chemical sludge instead of figuring out ways to ecologically eliminate that and take that out of the ecosystem or out of the cycle for good, it just keeps revolving around into this same cycle and this same cycle over and over again. And then they make fertilizers out of it. They make, they use it for uh, soil preparations. They use it, for, they figure out ways that they can take this toxic sludge and then use it for their advantage so they can turn it around since they have to process it anyway and then make money off of it. Yeah, so people eat all this food and, and live this you know, toxic lifestyle and then they f go to the bathroom when they can because most people are constipated anyway. And then they just flush the toilet and they think everything's gone. So it's like a flush and forget type of scenario. And they don't realize that, that it's right back on their dinner plate three weeks later. As part of our scientific analysis of biosludge products, we went out and purchased at retail in Austin, Texas, three different biosolids products that come from human sewage in different cities. Those products are milorganite for gardens, milorganite in the bulk bag for lawns, which comes from Milwaukee sewage, that's human sewage from the city of Milwaukee, and then Texas native Dillo dirt, which is human sewage from the city of Austin. These three products all make extraordinary claims about being eco-friendly and safe to use on uh, fruits and vegetables and even safe to use around children and pets. So let's take a look at the packaging and see exactly what they're claiming. So we want to be green, we want to protect the environment, so we're suckers for this kind of product, this Dillo Dirt product which has a cute little mascot with a little wheelbarrow, doesn't say human feces on it, but at least on the back, in, in Austin, Texas, on the back of the bag, it says, it recommends that you don't use this on crops for food production in humans, <laughs> but animals, yeah, that's okay. Austin, Texas is by no means the worst. This is milorganite. You notice the little eco-friendly label on the right? Look, it's eco-friendly. This is a bag of human feces, people, and it's eco-friendly. It's full of heavy metals and recreational drugs, hormone replacement therapy drugs, birth control pill drugs. I mean, 
this, 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 eco-friendly? This is an insult. On the back, it's got a, a, a warning. It says, hey, guess what? It's got chemicals known to cause cancer and birth defects. A big takeaway from this is that we all have to be, we have to have our radar going full time. We have to be on our game. Anybody makes any claim to you that something's eco-friendly or all natural or even organic in this case, all those things are in essence false for this, for this product. And yet these claims are very, very widespread. So I began to look at it. I found a book called Science for Sale by Dr. David Lewis. And I highly recommend this book. And Dr. Lewis saw his career destroyed by the EPA. We're going to protect the family farm and we are going to end the EPA intrusion into your lives. A lot of people would blame President Trump for our problems uh, today with the EPA. EPA was created by, I believe, Nixon during his administration. And like any uh, government bureaucracy, over time it has been corrupted and more corrupted. And now you see it controlled by parts of it by industry. Uh, the sewage industry is one. They're controlling the biosolids through lobbying, through money. It will be hard to take that down. Increasingly, from what I've observed, the EPA is almost more like a cheerleader for the industries that really are, at this point, causing vast contamination of the biosphere. When recently Monsanto was allowed to petition the EPA to increase the exposure limits for Roundup, um, it was clear at that time uh, that this was really a, a horrific decision due to the fact that we know now Roundup can actually act as a carcinogenic endocrine disruptor in the parts per trillion range. It, the EPA is not what it used to be. I believe it was um, at least created for all the right reasons. I, I, at least I'd like to believe that, uh, that uh, the reason for uh, bringing EPA to life was to really protect the environment. But uh, uh, what EPA is doing right now, it's far from the environment and far from protection. I think people like David Lewis, who was at some point EPA senior uh, staff scientist and who now are outspoken, independent scientific voices out there can again have uh, a say in the, how EPA functions. I worked at EPA for 32 years. Beginning in 1970 when EPA was created, EPA was a good agency, had good intentions, good scientists, that changed in 1993. Uh, there was a mass exodus of EPA scientists at that time. Uh, so the scientists that remain at EPA today is a different culture than when EPA was created. I am speaking out because science was everything to me and science is all about the truth. Uh, my life was dedicated to it. Once science at EPA was no longer about the truth, but it was about supporting certain industry practices and certain government policies. I wanted no part of it. But rather than walking out the door like many of EPA scientists did when that happened, I decided to stay in. I filed a series of whistleblower lawsuits to get discovery documents. Uh, I wanted to understand how this happened and uh, I felt like I could do more for science to tell this story than I could in a laboratory producing data that would never see the light of day anyway. In the federal government, when data are fabricated, they can get away with anything in the way of fraud, covering up adverse health effects, faking data. The individual at EPA who came up with EPA sludge policies, Henry Longus, uh, in the mid-1970s, and was still protecting uh, biosolids with fake data. When I left EPA in 2003, he received multiple presidential awards in the Rose Garden uh, by President Bush. Even though it was known 
uh, all of the fraudulent activities he was involved with. Uh, they are immune to prosecution. Uh, but let any scientist try faking data for his own personal gain, uh, they don't last any time. They will be fired and put in prison. But fake data for the government and its interest, in the industry's interest, and you will be promoted and protected at the highest levels. One of the very confusing aspects of this whole business of land-disposed toxic sewage sludge is based on the question, how can this be legal? If it is known to be so toxic, it is known to be the inciting agent of so many chronic and acute diseases, infectious diseases, cancer, neurological disorders, well, it has to do with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Years ago, they conferred the decisions on regulation and use of sewage sludge to the states. And the state departments of ecology or the state departments of environmental quality then had the right and the freedom to relax the regulations and adopt some EPA standards for concentrations of toxic or to apply their own regulations. State agencies tend to be cooperative, so the State Department of Ecology in Washington State, as one example, collaborates very nicely with the State Department of Agriculture. And State Departments of Agriculture like to help farmers, and one way they help them is to figure strategy for reducing costs of farming, including the costs of fertilizer. Counties, on the other hand, and municipalities have an enormous burden of what to do with all the sewage sludge. Nearly every municipality has a wastewater treatment plant. All of the sewage sludge is toxic. Wastewater treatment plants, as I say, do not treat wastewater. They separate it into the solids and the water with the intent of recycling the water and beneficially recycling the solids. The problem is, is that the standards and the testing of the solids, what we refer to as toxic sewage sludge, are so low and so minimal that all of these flame retardants, pesticides, industrial chemicals, infectious agents from medical facilities and just from the general public, as well as from agricultural operations, all end up right back into our food supply in the environment. Rightly or wrongly, politicians are more concerned about their retirement and getting reelected. So it's don't come in here and make waves. We have everything under control, and I have to worry about my retirement. Um, you hear that so often with municipal workers. You know, I'm not interested in you making any waves. I, I, I'm not interested in saving a buck because it's not my money, it's somebody else's money. And I don't want to have to, um, you know, run the risk of maybe it not working, and then I look bad, and somehow I, I end, end up sacrificing my career. All those are absolute inputs into why decisions are made on a municipal and a government level. And the municipality has farmed it out under contract to corporations that have very good legal staffs and will fight it tooth and nail. And they have no incentive in truly trying to uncover what the, has, not only the hazards, but what the probability of exposure would be. They have no incentive in going out because it's gonna upset their business model. Industries want to protect their bottom line. They will do anything as long as it's not illegal, totally illegal. They'll find the loopholes in the law and they will, you know, th so the reason why EPA is still pushing this is because the same people who wrote those rules, we call them the 503 rules, that, that uh, are the sludge rules, these same people are still in power. They are still in charge and they will not admit, no matter how many dead bodies, no matter how many dead cows, no matter how many people got sick, they will never admit that they made a mistake or they will never even admit that they base their data on information that is no longer, is antiquated, outdated, and maybe now we have new 
damaging data, and maybe now it's time to really overhaul the rules completely, that they will not admit it. In this lab, we've got the instruments to detect unknown chemicals. And let me explain this. Behind me, you see a mass spec instrument. The big one's called a mass spec time of flight instrument. It's got a flight tube, an actual vertical tube in a vacuum. And molecules are projected and focused into an ion beam in that tube. And then the time of their flight, so to speak, or the time it takes for them to travel through that tube is measured to determine their mass to charge ratio. All right, we've done the mass spec analysis and we have the results here. What did we find? Well, I'd like to draw your attention to the screen right now. This is, um, this is what's called the TIC result. This is the total ion chromatogram, or TIC for short. And here it is for the Dillo dirt from Austin, Texas. And here it is from uh, Mill Organite in Milwaukee. So right away, we can see that these look different and each peak is a different chemical. This is milorganite. Every color is a different potential chemical that was found in the analysis. In fact, every peak is a different potential chemical. And if we zoom in on this, we can actually see that there are thousands of different chemicals. The numbers you see are the uh, area response as well as the retention time. The x-axis is time. The y-axis is counts for that specific chemical mass. And if you look at our list over here, we see that we have 3,504 potential chemicals in the mill organite sample. Right here is warfarin, you know, blood thinner, that can be deadly. One of the side effects is death. And that's just one chemical out of you know thousands. Here's atrazine, right here, atrazine-D5. Atrazine is a toxic herbicide that causes a chemical castration and gender bender changes in both humans and amphibians. And here it is. We're seeing it identified as a likely candidate in this biosludge sample. You are being exposed to thousands of different chemicals, and yet they call it organic and they call it eco-friendly. That's milorganite. Even the name is misleading. So let's take a look at Dillo Dirt from Austin, Texas, and let's see how many chemicals we can find as potential candidates in that product. Is 1,969 candidate chemicals. So it's about half of the number of chemicals that were found in the Mill Organite product, roughly about 4,000. This is roughly about 2,000. And yet, many of them are the same. We have pesticides, herbicides, uh, atrazine, fungicides, pharmaceuticals. We have uh, recreational drugs and industrial chemicals, as well as chemical solvents, plasticizers, hormone disruptors. All of these things are found in Dillo Dirt. And this is in one microliter, one microliter, one millionth of a liter of Dillo Dirt. And this is being done again by cities. And Austin says it's a progressive city. Austin claims to be all about halting climate change and the eco-friendly technologies and clean solar energy. And yet they're selling this, thousands of chemicals, to their own residents. People are lining up to buy this stuff and put it on their gardens. They think they're home gardening with an organic fertilizer. Here's the truth that the city of Austin doesn't want you to see. I think one of the biggest issues with biosludge is that when we really look at our definition as a species today, we are primarily microbial as far as the genetic contribution alone. So microbes, fungi, bacteria, and those uh, microbes come largely from the food we consume and ultimately the soil that it's grown in. So when you're using biosludge to produce the food that then becomes the basis for our microbiome and our species definition, this issue is so much larger than at first it would appear. It's not just about toxicant exposure, it's actually about the very root of our species definition being completely undermined and ultimately the trajectory is towards the degeneration of our species if we continue using this as a, as a, as a soil amendment.
When I first started researching uh, sewage sludge or biosolids, uh, I went after the pathogen question. And there are probably, you know, a couple of dozen pathogens, you know, in sewage sludge. Uh, I found that the chemicals in sewage sludge is something that the sewage uh, community does not want to talk about. In fact, they refer to it as contaminants. When I researched that, I came across an EPA document called the Targeted National Survey of Sewage Sludge, and the last one released was in 2009, and it listed hundreds of chemicals in sewage sludge. Further research showed that uh, sewage sludge contains over 80,000 chemicals, and that's because the EPA made a, a rule that requires all industry to dump their uh, industrial chemicals in sewage, in, into the sewer system. So what the farmer's getting uh, that doesn't even have a clue about are all these chemicals. And nobody can answer the question, what degree of hazard, what concentrations of chemicals are in biosolids? About 90,000, 90,000 uh, chemicals in, in commerce today are already have already been discharged into soils and, and water and so forth. And every year there's a thousand new synthetic chemicals. And of course, EPA keeps selling us it's you know, nutrient rich. This is, you know, this is a myth. I mean, yes, there are nutrients in there. There's nitrogen in there. But with this uh, ability of industries able to discharge all all their chemicals and uh, into into the waste stream, you have uh, an unbelievably toxic containing material. This study that Ottawa U pointed out is a much better way of assessing sewage sludge contamination because it's a bacteria that survives virtually untouched through the anaerobic digestion process and that actually swims whereas the other bacteria, like the E. coli, they're only on the actual sewage itself, on the particles. But this stuff swims, it lives, and, and, so it, and it's almost, they, they said it, it's, it's really restricted to sewage, like it comes from our colons in our, in our bodies. And so they recommended that it be used as the indicator. Well, of course, that study was just, just disappeared. Nobody's, uh, nobody's commented on it or, or done anything about it. Let's take a look at biosludge under the microscope. So we've got a digital microscope here, and we've got some milorganite on a white uh, tissue. And we're going to zoom in and start to take a look at what we can see. Now you can see the, uh, the structure of the pebbles, which look like boulders under here. But as we zoom in more, you start to see features of mysterious fibers that don't necessarily look like plant fibers. Many of them start to look synthetic as you, as you really zoom in on it. And you can start to see that there are some very odd looking elements in this picture. What is this, what is this growth or structure there? What is this fiber? What are these chunks? And you can actually start to maneuver around the scene using this microscope setup. We're looking at essentially a, a dehydrated, pelletized form of human sewage. And it should be no surprise that it's full of all kinds of questionable and disgusting things. And throughout this landscape, you see mysterious fibers. Now we're starting to see more details about this structure. What is this, this yellow object that's lodged here inside the turd boulder? What does this look like? Microplastics. This is a kind of uh, pollution, a kind of contamination that's in the oceans. And it appears to be here in the bio sludge as well, connected to these other fibers. It's clearly a polymer. Or, or resembles one. And we have all these other fibers and strands that are in this biosolid product. It looks pretty creepy. Is this something that you want on your food? We zoom in here, here's another, it looks like a polymer of some sort. 
mixed in with everything else and all these bizarre fibers and whatever this mass is here that has glommed on to this turd boulder. You know, this, this is what you're putting on your garden, people. This is what's going on your food. First, notice that Mill Organite from Milwaukee says it's eco-friendly. This is one of the big claims. Eco-friendly. So if you take a concentrated form of human sewage, viruses, heavy metals, even industrial waste, all kinds of toxins, and you concentrate them, you can call it eco-friendly, according to Mill Organite. In small print, in complete contradiction to the primary claims on this label, they say that this product may cause cancer. This product contains detectable quantities of chemicals known to cause cancer, birth defects, or other reproductive harm, they say. They even say, by the way, do not apply near water, storm drains, or drainage ditches. You know why? Because if it runs off into the rivers and streams and oceans, it kills aquatic life. So they say, don't apply it where it might run off into the water. Instead, they say, apply this product only to your lawn and garden and sweep any product that lands on the driveway, sidewalk, or street back into your own garden to grow the foods that you're feeding your children. Now we get to Dillo Dirt, which comes from Austin, Texas. This is human sewage that people flush down the toilet in Austin. And you see an, an armadillo with happily carrying a wheelbarrow full of human sewage. They call it Dillo Dirt because they can't call it Austin sewage. Nobody would buy it. Now, in every case, these products claim to meet state standards and federal standards, which are, of course, a joke when it comes to real eco-sensitivity and human health. This product says it's a sewage product of the city of Austin water and wastewater utility, which has been processed in a manner that meets all of the Texas Natural Resource Conservation Commission requirements for, quote, uncontrolled use as an organic soil conditioner. This isn't organic from the point of view of being clean or certified organic or producing organic food. If you put this on food, that food is not organic. That food is polluted, contaminated food. But they don't tell you that on the bag, do they? They just have a happy image and happy claims and they say, no problem, use it almost everywhere. The E. coli, there's 157 different serotypes of E. coli in, every, in, in, in somebody's gut. Um, so there is the um, potential, for example, the serotype of E. coli I have in my gut, probably my family has the same serotype. There's only one chance in 157 that the E. coli in your gut is the same in mine. So you could actually, your E. coli would make me very sick. So, but there's 156 chances out of 157 that I'm gonna get sick if I get contaminated with your E. coli. All 157 varieties are in bio, biosolids. And that's the problem in, in the bioterrorism paper that I, that I wrote. That is a serious concern because now someone can go and take that and it's not DNA traceable. It's as simple as going out to the field that you throw biosolids out, putting it in an eight ounce jar, adding a little fluid, a little water to it, putting it in a spray bottle, going across the U.S. and spray it on salad bars as you go from town to town. Four and a half million people could be infected within two weeks. That's the reality. People can argue that, but they won't survive the argument. The subject of uh, bioterrorism has been brought up and if you consider Dallas, Texas, when it was uh, tasked with Ebola, and the way Ebola works is it causes dehydration in the victim and in the form of diarrhea and uh, also vomiting. And you gotta think about where that went. It went into the sewer system. Uh, it went down the sewer system and ended up in biosolids. And in fact, uh, the CDC had special sessions with sewage industry to talk about that, and they were closed door sessions. So I don't know what that was said, but they had a concern. The same thing could be 
talked about bioterrorism, where a terrorist pulls into a hotel and flushes whatever down the toilet and contaminates, and then the sewage industry disperses for them. Yeah, I don't think their intention is terrorism, but uh, you know, uh, it doesn't matter what their intention, the intentions are profit, I believe, but what they are doing out of ignorance and greed uh, is basically a form of, of domestic terrorism when unknowingly or uh, unwillingly they spread uh, uh, the myriad of uh, pathogens and toxins that cannot be eliminated from the natural environment and the uh, uh, general public people that are they don't have a recourse to protect themselves from it and they don't are not aware how what they're being exposed to suffer the consequences and yeah it is a form of environmental crime that is being committed it is possible to create resistant strains by plan and intent to use as a weapon in biological warfare. The intent of that kind of behavior is to cause primary infections who people, in people who may be consuming the food or water. The secondary unexpected but appreciated consequences of this activity is that all of the victims of this first biobomb bearer are the people who get exposed to the sewage sludge in the wastewater affluent where all of these people discarded their own waste. So this is a problem that multiplies itself in our living environment. All it takes is one person in one city to create a tremendous infectious disease event that can be extremely costly. It's costly to the healthcare system but also there are enormous economic costs because people who are infected are taken out of the workforce. So you have more than just the infected individual, you have a healthcare system that's compromised and you have extraordinary economic impacts. After 9-11, I was put on EPA's short list of bioterrorism experts to contact in case of a bioterror bioterrorism attack on the United States. Uh, I submitted a report to EPA that my concerns was over land application of biosolids because anyone can walk up to a sewage treatment plant, access a sewer line, and put uh, tons of material in it that would never be detected that would go to the sewage treatment plant, go out onto farms and contaminate our land. Uh, this is a, an open door, an open invitation to bioterrorism. EPA lacks regulations on sewage sludge. Uh, they'll go right, uh, any toxic chemical that a bioterrorist could want to use can be added to a sewer, go through the plant, be spread out in the surrounding city and countryside, courtesy of the municipal government. Nobody will know it until people start dropping dead. When you dump these toxins into an ecosystem, you gotta understand that that ecosystem is full of living animals that will then spread those toxins. So you've got birds, you've got ground animals such as squirrels, and you have insects, uh, flies, just common flies, for example, that are attracted to this waste product, and then they spread it. Uh, even moths can spread it. And these toxins then contain viral strains and bacterial strains and, and fungi. And this then gets spread out like an expanding biological weapon system. It's almost as if uh, dumping bio sludge in a forest or in any kind of natural area is a kind of ecological terrorism. Uh, if you were a terrorist organization and you wanted to harm the ecosystem, and wipe out life in a forest, for example, you would try to find a substance like this that's full of thousands of potential poisonous toxic chemicals. And you would dump that and you would see life destroyed. Well, cities are doing that. They don't call themselves terrorists, but the outcome is still the same. It's ecological devastation. This is the extermination of life and the disruption of natural food webs and ecosystem uh, interdependencies. And this is being done in the name 
of eco-friendly, sustainable, organic fertilizer. That's what's most astonishing about this. Here we have the absolute destruction of ecology, the destruction of life, the mass poisoning of our world in the name of being green. In this modern era, we would expect environmental firms and environmental organizations and environmentally sensitive agencies at all levels of government would be more concerned about human health and environmental health. For some reason, the need for human and environmental health have not caught up with our production of toxic waste. Residents of cities of intense urban environments seldom have an awareness of what happens to any of their toxic materials once they flush, once something goes down a drain. Where does it go? What happens to it? What is the fate of those materials? It's not that they are insensitive to environmental issues. It's not that they don't care about human health, but there is a fog over us as a nation that we assume that governments take care of us and that all of this toxic waste disappears out of sight not to cause further problems. New York City is known as one of the most environmentally sensitive cities in North America, as dense as the population may be. But when you make an inquiry of people in New York about where the sewage goes, they don't know. Many of them do know there are major wastewater treatment plants in New York, and they know that the water gets flushed right into their waterways that surround New York, but the sewage sludge itself is hauled by truck and train points west. Pennsylvania and other states west become the receiving grounds of these thousands, hundreds of thousands of tons of sewage sludge just from New York alone. And it goes on the food crops that go right back to New York because New York City doesn't really grow any food crops of its own. So they're recycling the toxics right back into their own environmentally sensitive community. The toxic chemicals that are in sludge now that's been applied to the land, uh, most of those are going to be, still be a problem centuries from now in the soil. Uh, the next ice age will come and go. And when the ice recedes, there will still be heavy metals in all these soils. Uh, it's unimaginable what we are doing now from the standpoint of how unfixable this is if we let it keep going. I think the answer to this is pretty simple. I think it's money. And uh, it, you can make a lot of money on climate change scare and you can make a lot of money on uh, easy money on distributing the sludge and if you eliminate that I, I, I just I really I think it is a profit that drives uh, those eco trends and scaring people into believing that the, you know Glaciers will melt and we will all drown because the oceans will rise and all that and because of a human um, activity. But there is a human activity that actually destroys our environment and that is applying, for example, applying sludge on agricultural land. And that is not being reported and that's it, it, maybe I'm simplifying, and I probably am simplifying the reason, but I think it's uh, human nature. It's, a, it's a money, it's careers at stake, it's a status quo, maintaining the status quo. We are resistant to change. What I think and what has happened around the country is companies like Cinegro, uh, these sewage companies, they will contribute money to these organizations and, you know, and they they let them know, and then the organization feels like they owe them a favor. People are only green until, it, until they have to remove money from their wallet. Big companies are the same way. 
Oh, let's talk about a good PR program here. We are, we are definitely environmentalists. No, it's going to cost you $200 million for you to fix your marsh, your wetlands problem. Well, we're not that green. <laughs> I'm not going to spend that. I mean, and everybody's green until it impacts them. That's the problem. They have no vision. They're only looking at it from a PR point of view is how does it generate more revenue for me? How does it generate more benefits for me? So making a shit brick and forcing people to buy it doesn't do anything for them. This is an attack on not just science, it's an attack on humanity. It's an attack on the integrity of the food supply. It's an attack on the sustainability of life on our planet. Our ecosystem is in the crosshairs of this biosludge industry. They're making money while poisoning the planet with toxins that persist in the environment and in combination may have unknown consequences for ecological health and human health. This could be affecting fertility for generations yet to come. We are creating a perfect shitstorm, literally speaking, by doing what we're doing with our sludge. That uh, it's a basically a perfect recipe for yeah for long-term horrible consequences for natural environment and for humans. And it is uh, whether unintentional or intentional, yeah, it, it is a perfect recipe for long-term dire environmental and health consequences. An approach like um, Switzerland, I believe, is one of, they don't do any sludge application in the farmland because people don't like it. And actually, uh, uh, Swiss government listens to their people and they used to do that and people spoke their mind and they don't anymore. They incinerate it. But other countries, such as in Scandinavia and, and Europe, Germany and Switzerland in particular, in many areas have totally forbidden and abolished the land disposal of sewage sludge. So by default, they have to move to the thermal conversion or thermal decomposition alternatives. So German engineering and ingenuity have come to the fore in the production of new thermal conversion systems for converting sewage sludge into useful products for industry. But by incinerating it, you, you see, you've destroyed the toxic organic molecules. You've destroyed the pesticides and the herbicides. You've destroyed the hormone disruptors and the pharmaceutical uh, hormone drugs, you know, HRT drugs and so on. It's the incineration that is the critical process here. Now, you haven't eliminated all the heavy metals, but you've eliminated the organic molecules, which really is the greatest threat to this. And you've killed viruses and bacteria and fungi. Incineration is such a simple solution. You might wonder, why aren't cities doing it? Well, because it costs them money. It takes energy to incinerate biosludge. And so instead of spending the money and responsibly eliminating the dangers of their sewage product, they instead package it and claim it's organic and claim it's eco-friendly and then sell it to people where it goes on to poison the environment. Well, temporarily, you can put, the, put it in, they all have um, uh, waste disposal sites for their garbage, and they're all engineered and lined and everything else, and the sewage sludge can be mixed with the garbage and put in there. And one of the, you know, one of the arguments is that, oh, well, that'll waste space that could be taken up for garbage, but it doesn't waste space because 70% uh, because of the sewage sludge is water. And so it's only going to take 30%, and half of that 30% of matter of actual matter is going to turn into methane gas. And you catch it, you put a lid over the, you put a cover over the over the garbage dump, and you you capture that, and you can burn it. You can even generate electricity with it, use it as a fuel. So that leaves like 10 to 15%, and that gets that gets concentrated. I mean, that is all mixed in with the garbage, so it's filling in spaces and holes in the garbage. So the most that you're going to get from that is 10% of mass added from the initial am amount. So it's crazy to think that that is, you know, going to waste space in the dumps. 
It's not. It takes up very little space. It's very practical weight. And, but you only have to do that on a temporary basis until you can get the gasification plants and the pyrolysis plants built. It's unfortunate about our, our, our youth uh, that they're growing up in this contaminated world, okay? It's not, it's a fact that they are. Uh, it's, there's just no telling what all is contaminating because they just won't run tests on it. We know that there are chemicals in our tap water. They have run tests on that. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of chemicals that they found in tap water. So what are the chemicals that they're not testing for? Are they in tap water as well? And, and where do these chemicals come from? Did it come from Joe Smith dumping his prescription in the lake? I don't think so. It's coming from sewage, from farms, from the sewage plant. The only way to fix something like this is a public outcry. Uh, future generations are going to have to deal with this. Um, we, we're leaving nothing but polluted rivers for them to fix. And until somebody, and it, unfortunately it's going to take the younger generation, is going to have to step up and say, what are you doing to me? What are you doing to my offspring? Why are you allowing this to happen? They're going to have to change the way that politics is done. Somebody's going to have to get involved. And unfortunately, older people like me, we just want to step out. But um, it's the younger generation. And um, the changes that I've seen since the 60s are unbelievable. I can't believe that we've got to the polluted state, and this is in my lifetime. So that's less than 100 years. What's going to happen in 200 years if we don't turn this around? Um, this is pretty serious stuff. Nature will always survive. I'm not so sure about human beings. This is Mike Adams, the creator of the Biosludge film, founder of CWC Labs, publisher of naturalnews.com, and creator of the YouTube alternative video community known as brighteon.com. I'm bringing you a special commentary here because every institution in the world is trying to hide this Biosludge issue from you. Every institution, maybe an institution that you have come to trust the corporate-run media is lying and covering it up. The institution of science has been hijacked by industry. So science, even though I practice science, I follow science, I espouse the benefits of science, but the science institution is trying to censor independent scientists like myself or Dr. David Lewis, who are sounding the alarm on this issue. So you can't even trust the science journals. Government has abandoned the people on this issue. The EPA is really now the Environmental Pollution Agency. The EPA has become so corrupt and so beholden to the interests of industry that the EPA is, is frankly a clear and present danger to the people of the United States of America. There's no question at this point. So government won't solve this. Media won't solve this. The universities are not teaching the truth about this. They're fixated on carbon dioxide, which they claim is the number one pollutant of concern. You know, they say it's global warming and climate change. So it, it's sleight of hand. They want you to look at carbon dioxide, even though CO2 is the number one life-giving molecule for plants on our planet. CO2 is the regreening molecule. CO2 regrows forests. CO2 increases the efficiency of food crop production. CO2 is mother nature's molecule of life. And yet, perhaps even you have been so indoctrinated by the, the daily dose of misinformation from universities and the science establishment and the media establishment that you might even believe that CO2 is a pollutant and that biosludge isn't. They've flipped everything upside down. CO2 is good for plants and good for forests and good for food production. Biosludge is toxic to humanity and toxic to the ecosystem. And environmentalists, sadly, 
have abandoned, for the most part, the real threats to our environment. What are the real threats? Well, the mass pollution of the soils, biosludge. You've got genetic pollution from GMOs, and you've got glyphosate, an herbicide that now saturates the food supply with cancer-causing poison. Where are the environmentalists? They're focused on climate change and CO2. They're not focused on the real issues that are polluting and contaminating our world right now, causing infertility and cancer. And even now we have this polio-like illness, this, this mystery disease that's affecting children all across America. There's a massive CDC cover-up. They don't want to talk about what's causing that. And the experts haven't figured it out yet. It's probably related to chemical exposure through biosludge, pesticides, toxic medicines. The institutions in power don't want to tell you the truth about what's actually poisoning humanity. They want you to give them more power through elections, for example. And yet both political parties are abandoning humanity when it comes to this issue of biosludge, biotoxins. Think about it. Where are the Democrats on this issue? Nowhere to be found. Where are the Republicans? Not busy with other stuff. There is no political process by which this can be solved because industry has so corrupted government that government has become the problem. Government cannot give you the solution to this mass chemical contamination and environmental destruction and human health destruction that's taking place because of biosludge. It's even worse than you might suppose. These institutions are run by people who are all part of a, a really a worldwide effort to try to depopulate the planet. It's, it's openly talked about now in many circles. They believe, these scientists and these high-level globalist bureaucrats, they believe that there are too many humans living on the planet. And they literally want to eliminate uh, six billion people, maybe more, depending on who you're talking to. And because they think that the sustainability of, of the Earth can only be achieved through drastic reductions of uh, population. And there are documentaries out there that, that are worth watching on this, the population bomb, population explosion. Uh, you can go back to the work of, of course, Ehrlich back in the 1970s, who warned about this. But ask yourself, you are part of that population that's living today. How do you suppose the powers that be might eliminate 6 billion people from the planet. To accomplish that, they either have to achieve mass infertility or mass death. Those are the only two options. And when you look at this practice of the mass poisoning of our soils and our food supply and our environment, you can't help but ask, is this deliberate? Is this a mechanism by which the human population is being exposed to an incredible array of toxins, not just chemical, but biological. Uh, think about it. Every biological uh, weapon system, let's say, that is dropped into the sewer system is then automatically spread by cities to the countryside all across America. You saw the documentary that the biosludge waste from New York City and New Jersey and other places on the East Coast gets spread all across America. This is the mass chemical poisoning of the American people, and it is deliberate, and there is a cover-up. And every institution that's in power today is working against humanity. And this is a realization that very few people have come to. The government will not save you. Voting Democrat or Republican will not save you. Asking science to solve this problem will not save you because science is uh, sweeping this under the rug. Going to the medical institutions will not save you. They profit from disease. They profit from cancer and Alzheimer's. They have no incentive to eliminate this chemical exposure. The agriculture giants, they have no interest in solving this problem because it's their poisons that are in the food supply. They are part of the problem. Uh, Bayer, Monsanto, you name it. There is no institution. The media won't tell you the truth about this. The environmentalists are too focused on climate change. Even the tech giants, they censor all this information. Facebook, Google, YouTube, and Twitter. Uh, they've been censoring my work for years. YouTube completely shut off my video channel earlier this year so that you could not see the videos that I'm producing. Videos that warn humanity about what's coming, about what's happening. 
Uh, YouTube is evil. Google is intensely evil. Facebook is evil. And they will censor anybody who, who talks about the true story of what's happening with biosludge today. Because they, they do not support the environment. They do not support independent journalism. They do not support real science. They are controlled censors. They are controlled tyrants. They are authoritarians. And anyone who dares to question the status quo, even if that status quo is engaged in the mass murder of humanity, they will be silenced, censored, shut down, shut off the internet, and, and viciously attacked on top of that, smeared, slandered, you name it. I've had all that happen to me, which is why I've put out this film for free. It's why I've, I'm encouraging you to uh, post this film to your own YouTube channel. Just, just give us credit, link back to brighteonfilms.com, but post it everywhere. Post snippets from the film. And we're going to do more. In the name of humanity, we're doing more. And we've got films coming up, all science-based films that will absolutely blow your mind. The next one is actually a short film that will, it'll rock your world. And it'll be censored. But if you go directly to brighteonfilms.com, you'll be able to see it. In fact, let me give you a few tips how you can stay in touch with my work. Uh, number one, you can read naturalnews.com. We have announcements there. You can join the email list there for daily email newsletters. I cover all this and much more. You can go to brighteonfilms.com and sign up to the email list there. And we'll alert you every time we release a new film. You can also just go to brighteon.com and join that online video community. And right now it's mostly political videos, but soon we're breaking that into segments. We'll have health, uh, environment, uh, survival and prepper videos, plus then politics and news. Uh, all that will be there in different segments, so you can choose the segment that you want. Most of all, you, you've got to wake up and you've got to help wake up others. You know, there's, there's such division in America today on politics, but it's all a scam. It's all a They've got us focused on hating each other for political reasons or hating each other for race reasons or, you know, some people hate white people now and some people hate black people. Some people hate Christians. This hatred and division, it prevents us all from working together as a human race to save ourselves from the massive death cult, really, is that, that government and industry has become. This collusion between industry and government, it's a, it's a death cult, it's a murderous regime. And if we don't stop them, all of us together as human beings, if we don't stop them, they will destroy our world. They will destroy our ecosystems, they'll destroy the aquatic uh, marine ecosystems, they'll destroy all the fish in the sea. They'll destroy the land, the air, and the water. They'll destroy the food supply, and this is part of their goal. They literally do not want you around. They do not want humans to continue to proliferate. This is their stated goal. So if you want to survive, if you want to have a future for humanity, somehow we the people must really overthrow this entire system of government and industry and corruption. And this is not against free market capitalism. It's against corrupt capitalism, not corrupt free markets. Some of you may say, well, Free markets are the problem. No, corruption is the problem. Because uh, look at communist China, the worst environmental nation in the world, run by communists. They, they pollute everything. They are murdering their people with a severity that we can't even imagine in America today. Communism does not equal environmental stewardship, not by a long shot. But neither does a corrupt free market system. We need honest competition. We need a meritocracy, I believe. But we need to hold our governments and our corporations accountable. And so there's, there's room for that on the political left and with conservatives and libertarians as well. Everybody who wants to live should be on the same side here, fighting against the mass pollution, fighting against the government corporate collusion and corruption that now typifies our society. It almost doesn't matter who you vote for anymore, you're still being poisoned. And so the solution cannot come through the ballot box. The solution can only come from we the people rising up and demanding an end to the murderous regimes of globalism that are trying to 
kill us off and kill off our, our, our children and even just erase our fertility. They want the human race to practically come to an end for whatever evil nefarious reasons they have. They are the enemies of humanity. And they, they will not stop until they poison every single one of us. Actually, they've already done that. Every time you eat food that's grown in biosludge, you are poisoned. Just, just living in modern society saturates you with poison. You can eat organic, and that helps, and I advocate that. But even if you eat organic, your body still contains glyphosate. It still contains, you know, hormone drugs. It still contains plasticizer hormone disruptors and mimickers. You are being biologically altered by the chemical intoxication of our environment. Something's going to have to change or the global ecosystem will collapse and humanity will go down and we will cause a mass extinction as we're going down. It's well underway. As Dr. David Lewis said in the film, the problems that we're creating today with biosludge will last for centuries, if not millennia. They'll still be able to find the heavy metals in the soil. You know, a million years from now that we spread all across the lands. We've poisoned the land for millennia. The future of humanity, if it even survives this global onslaught, will be dealing with the pollution that we're causing now because we, the people in the present, were too foolish to stand up and stop the mass poisoning of our world, of our physical world, our soils, our food supply, our croplands, our forests. If we don't stop it, we don't survive. We don't make it. Now, I don't have children, but perhaps you do. I want your children to be able to survive this. I want your children to prosper. I want humanity to make it. And I'm going to use every effort that I can during the remainder of my life to try to save humanity from this, this evil agenda of mass poisoning, genocide, and depopulation. I'm going to use Brighteon Films as an outlet for many of these science-based films that are coming out. I've got a multi-million dollar laboratory facility, CWC Labs, of course, where we're doing much of this research. We've got multiple mass spec instruments working on a triple quad mass spec right now. I appreciate your support. You can support me in what we do and continue to fund these films by visiting my online store where everything that we sell is lab tested to make sure it's clean. It's the cleanest supplements, the cleanest superfoods on the planet. We test everything. And that store is called healthrangerstore.com. You vote with your dollars. If you want to vote for our work in the name of humanity, just purchase products at healthrangerstore.com. Lab tested, high nutrient density, ultra clean, ultra potent, 700 different products. Products for your home, green living, dietary supplements, all kinds of amazing solutions there, healthrangerstore.com. And the more support we get from you there, the more films we can make like this one. And the, the more we can expand our science lab, the more we can really do the job that needs to be done, the job that the EPA has abandoned, the job the, F, the FDA has walked away from, the job the government's supposed to be doing, but they've become a joke. We the people have to do this, and I need your help to get it done. So thank you for your support. I'm Mike Adams. We will continue to produce films like this on topics that affect all of us, regardless of your political affiliation, regardless of your race, your gender, your sexual orientation, your religion, your nationality. I want you to live. I want you to be safe. I love humanity. I have compassion for every living being. And if we work together, perhaps, perhaps we can stop this mass poisoning of our world. Thank you for watching. Explore more educational films at brighteonfilms.com.